So we're not too interested in this kind of scale because, as we said, um, Visa is already doing a lot more than this. And so if you're going to come up with a compelling solution, you have to do a lot more than Visa. Never mind the Visa solution. So how do we go about um, building software? Well, one of the things we use is a sometimes termed uh, mechanical sympathy. So we look very closely at how um, we utilize the um, hardware to its best effect. So um, in this case, we've got, um, say, a series of microservices, and we've bound them to individual CPUs on, um, uh, on a server. So this is something we actually do, is we assign uh, different microservices to specific CPUs, and then we isolate their CPUs so they don't run anything outside. Uh, this is very much uh, from a low latency point of view, but there are some advantages in um, uh, heading down to the low level, particularly if you're trying to do throughput. Um, so one of the design considerations we made um, in trying to get a high throughput system is to make each operation quite simple. So we focused on two key operations, which is um, transfer of value, and the other one is exchange of value. So these are the two most common fundamental transactions that occur, and in fact, uh, the most common transactions that occur in the financial world as well. Um, so we're looking to model um, well understood, very simple transactions, which therefore have very uh, low security surface area, the chance of being hacked is much lower because they're very basic transactions. Um, we have other mechanisms for handling user specified smart contracts. We do something similar to Hyperledger, which is you have an off chain, or in that case, a, a private chain, which can run any kind of extension. But um, for the core system, we try and get it to the center. So, before I go into some of the more details, what, what were we actually able to achieve? So, if you have a decent sized workstation um, these days, um, that, uh, let's say, got eight core i7. Um, it can actually sustain around 52,000 transactions per second. So you're already above Visa. Uh, this is for a single chain. Um, it can take bursts higher than that. However, if you use um, a collection of servers, um, most, uh, well, we've, we've been able to test it at 400,000. We well, can probably do a bit better than that, but um, uh, that, that, that requires a cluster of um, uh, this is a cluster of servers working together to act as a single node within a cluster. So there has to be multiple of these to run uh, an entire chain. Um, so there's a lot of processing power, but at least um, you're getting a very high throughput. Um, so uh, so move into some of the design considerations. One of the obvious ones is why use Java? Well, actually, in the solution we have, if you look at the amount of CPU power and what that CPU power is doing, we're not using Java very much at all. Most of it is spent um, adding the signatures and verifying them, um, which is an essential part of the blockchain solution. If you're going to run a blockchain publicly, you have to have uh, fraud detection, and that uses up a lot of CPU. The algorithm we're actually using has been written in assembly. So it's not written in, well, there is a C variation, but the most efficient one is actually written in assembly. So, um, so in fact, most of the CPU power actually is run in assembly. Another one which um, uh, uses up a lot of CPU is handling um, all the TCP connections. So you've got a large number of TCP collection connections, potentially, um, that, that has a significant overhead. That's all written in, again, uh, code that's already available um, that's in the operating system itself. Uh, we're not writing that. Now, if you get down in, in this system, a system at this scale, how much CPU is actually spent in Java, it's a, it's a, it's a fraction of less than 10%, about four CPUs worth of Java. So if you used another language, you could cut that down a little bit more, but in reality, uh, in Java, it's, 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 it's more than efficient enough to, um, to be just a fraction of all the CPU you're actually uh, using anyway. Um, on the flip side, um, by using Java, we have access to much more developers. Um, many more developers can code in Java, and in the next iteration of our solution, we're going to focus very much on 
um, how do you easily drop in and like a little bit of code, a couple of classes, and away you go. You've got, um, you've got an extension to the blockchain with the Java. Um, so we're looking to make it a, a very simple uh, plug-in mo module system where you can you can add in functionality. Um, and this is all possible to do in Java very easily because of the, uh, the virtual machine environment it runs in. So one of the key aspects of um, how um, uh, any blockchain works is how do you achieve consensus. So in our case, what we do is we go through a, a series of stages. Um, the stages aren't guaranteed to always achieve consensus. However, um, we can keep the rounds very short. We're looking at rounds of five to ten milliseconds, and so if um, if um, a small percentage of the time we don't achieve consensus, you should be able to achieve a consensus in the next round or the next round after that. So um, we can retry um, very in, in rapid succession. Um, we have to test this in, in a real environment to work out how often it does it fail to achieve consensus immediately. Um, certainly in our test it always achieves it straight away, but uh, we're not necessarily working on realistic networks with um, uh, heterogeneous machines and so on. Uh, we're not working in a non-ideal case. So we have a diagram for that which I think you can't really read, but um, nevertheless, um, the way it works is that from left to right we have a client, uh, that client uh, connects to a gateway which feeds through a number of different stages for each transaction um, with the aim of first working out what um, every machine knows about every other machine, so the costing phase. Then they all vote on which um, blocks uh, should be included. And finally, um, uh, if any one of the nodes sees that a majority of nodes vote the same way, um, you've now got consensus. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, one of the key things about this is everything is done in parallel and concurrently. There's a lot of duplicate effort, but there isn't a lot. Because we're uh, constraining the number of nodes, there's not a lot of power to be saved by reducing the amount of duplicate effort. Um, finally, uh, once you achieve consensus, they can all replay uh, those nodes. So taking a step back, what is fundamentally, what is a blockchain? A blockchain is a chain of blocks of transactions. So the chain is a, a sequence of transactions that occur one after the other, and they're built up in such a way that they become increasingly immutable, uh, depending on how it's built. So maybe you can go back and change the previous block, but uh, certainly for Bitcoin, it's considered changing a block more than six uh, old is, is near impossible. So, um, so it builds up this chain of transactions. Where does the block come into it? Well, um, each round is quite expensive. Even in our case, if the, the, the length of a round is quite significant. But in Bitcoin, the length of a round is 10 minutes. So if you could only achieve one transaction every 10 minutes, that wouldn't be very efficient. So instead, what it does is it creates a whole block, which is basically a batch, batch of transactions. So every 10 minutes, you get a new batch of transactions which is the block bit. So it's literally a chain of blocks of transactions. Um, it's essentially uh, what the name means. So another key feature that distinguishes blockchain from other solutions is that it's not just a distributed ledger. So a distributed ledger is, um, generally speaking, all of the servers involved in that distributed ledger are trusted. They trust each other. They may not trust the outside world, but they trust each other. That means they don't need to verify anything, any message that any other node in the distributed ledger sends it. Um, they can just assume that once it's connected, maybe it's over SSH, uh, so that there's no man in the middle attack, the nodes actually trust each other. That means that um, all of the, you, you implicitly trust anyone running any of the other nodes as well. So generally speaking, most distributed ledgers are actually run by just one department in an organization. So it's not even cross department within an organization. Never mind across organization, never mind across uh, individuals you know nothing about. Right? So, so, uh, so for example, in Ripple, um, all of the participants are generally major banks. 
they know about each other. They may not trust each other completely, but they know who all the participants are. In Bitcoin, for example, um, all the nodes are somewhat anonymous. Some of the nodes are completely anonymous. You have no idea that they are. You don't know to what degree they're attempting to manipulate the system. So they're, they're truly untrustworthy. So the main difference between blockchain and a distributed ledger is that blockchain will check. Um, we will not make the assumption that any of the participants are behaving correctly. So, so in a HA environment, high availability, it's generally the case that it's either running or it's failed. Right? So as long as you detect that a node is running, then you can trust it. And um, if it's not running at all, then you just cut it, you can cut it off. Whereas um, uh, what blockchain attempts to uh, protect against is a Byzantine failure where a good percentage of the nodes are actively trying to um, scam the system. Right? So there's a financial incentive for them to defraud all the other nodes in the system. Um, so uh, you actually uh, need to det you can detect, in theory at least, up to a third of the nodes are, are acting in bad faith, like actively attempting to defraud everyone else. Um, there's a theory that shows that once you achieve, you have more than a third trying to defraud it, it's very difficult to determine who is defrauding who isn't in a fair manner. Um, so, so with blockchain, the main thing is that you can run it publicly, the nodes involved don't need to trust each other or they, they have a different trust model than, than let's say in a distributed database or a distributed ledger. Um, which also means though that, that a lot of the blockchain solutions out there are uh, are more blockchain, so they're often distributed ledgers that have a blockchain feel to them, but in reality can't be run publicly because they don't have that fraud detection. Um, and so, uh, in some ways, they're they're not not much more than what a distributed ledger can do. Um, the other key thing is that um, one example of a distributed ledger is a, a database with high availability. So that's one form of distributed ledger. So. There's a lot of blockchain solutions out there, a lot of blockchain projects that I've seen or I've heard about, where if you ask them, well, could you have just done it with a database? The answer is generally yes. Um, it, but the thing is that blockchain is uh, more appealing, um, more interesting to work on. Um, so they're not necessarily needing to use a blockchain. Um, the flip side of that is that like, you, you say, well, what could you run on a blockchain? Well, actually, you could run anything currently running on a database. Anything you're using a database for, certainly on the writing side, so not the recording side so much, but anything you're, you're doing on the recording side could be done uh, using a blockchain. Whether it should be done or not is another question. But in terms of its applications, potential applications, this is why there's basically all database apps. What did we do in terms of fraud detection? Um, well, we've uh, we've decided to use um, uh, an, uh, encryption, uh, an ASIC, uh, asymmetric encryption called ED um, two five five one nine. Um, this is a, is a two hundred and fifty six bit encryption that has been heavily optimized for. Um, um, working on a computer. So it, it is part of a family of encryption algorithms, and they've just chosen the parameters to be one that can be computed very efficiently. So um, essentially, they use a prime number, but the prime number it can actually be, um, its multiplication can be computed very cheaply for, on a computer. Um, and there's, a, there's an assembly version. Um, the interesting thing is that if you um, use, generally speaking, as you add more bits, um, the uh, cost goes up dramatically. It's non-linear. In reality, the 256-bit version, because it's so heavily optimized, is actually a lot faster than some of the shorter versions, um, just because they haven't been as heavily optimized. So in that case, what we do is every message that goes out gets signed. So it adds a 64-bit byte in the signature. Um, and um, every message as it comes in it gets verified. And that way we can ensure that the only person or the only computer that could have created that message is a holder of the private key. So 
So you don't know whether that private key has been compromised and copied and hacked. But um, you know that that message could only have come from uh, a computer that has a copy of the private Which also means that individual nodes running the cluster can't create fake messages unless they have a copy of the private key. All they can do is relay existing messages that were produced by something else. They can copy it around, they can read it, they can verify it. They can't create them for themselves because, of, um, they, they, because they can't generate the signature. They can, however, generate signatures for their own private keys. So they, each node has its own address, its own private key. It can create messages, but it can't pretend that they came from somewhere else. So, um, so one of the things I found interesting about this exercise, this project, is that we're very much optimizing for throughput. Uh, and my background is much more optimizing for low latency. And, uh, I actually found this uh, quite liberating. It's quite a lot of the techniques that you can't do in low latency, such as batching. Um, you have to be extremely careful how you do batching, um, but if you do it at all, um, they're all available to you for um, high throughput um, uh, computing. So I, uh, I really like that aspect of it. Um, one of the key things to identify for optimizing for throughput is what can be done concurrently versus what will can only be done serially and therefore will become a bottleneck. So identify that fortunately sign and verify is concurrent. Uh, each message individually can be verified and signed individually, completely independent of any other message. And so that can be, the, uh, you can just throw CPUs at the which is nice because that's where most of the CPU goes. Uh, the second biggest CPU consumer is handling all the TCP connections, and again, that's very easy to paralyze, um, which is fortunate. Uh, so the two bottlenecks really are the um, achieving consensus and throughput processing. Uh, fortunately, for consensus, we control the um, parameters of consensus. We can control how many nodes are involved, as you increase the number of nodes, the time to uh, the overhead of the consensus increases. Uh, so even though you've got more processing power, it still takes longer for them all to agree and also all see what everyone else is seeing and so on. Um, so in fact, um, one of the problems that Bitcoin had was its success um, because as the number of nodes goes up, the, the, the overhead goes um, up with log n. So it's a system that actually gets slower as you add more nodes, not, not even uh, no, no speed up. It doesn't speed up, it doesn't stay the same, it actually gets worse. And so uh, with 100,000 or 200,000 nodes, um, it just gets slower and slower to achieve consensus. Um, so one of the things you can do is we can, uh, we have other metrics where we control the number of nodes running a chain and we can split the chain, so you just kind of end up creating more chains as you get more nodes. That way the number of nodes in the chain can be uh, within some upper threshold, and we're thinking of somewhere around 100 nodes should be enough to run the chain. Um, you also decide how often you achieve consensus. So uh, coming to consensus less often reduces the overhead, but of course it increases latency. So you want to uh, find a natural trade-off there. Um, I, the other constraint to uh, achieving consensus is how uh, widely distributed the nodes are. So they, they can't achieve consensus very easily if they're dotted all around the world. Um, you can't um, get them to agree um, very easily if they, if they can't send messages backwards and forwards as to what's going on. So, however, as the way we split in the chains is that as they split, they will become more and more regionalized and so more and more local. So it could be, for example, a Melbourne chain, a London chain, and by having a, then, then local servers, the actual time between consensus could be improved. Uh, another thing that we added, um, which is not unique, so um, some other high throughput solutions are looking to do this, is having regular checkpoints. Uh, because of our background in FX, focus very much on a weekly cycle. So every week, um, the entire system checkpoints. 
which allows new nodes to enter in and only have to roll forward from the checkpoint. Um, part of the, the reason for doing this is that um, a blockchain at the moment can take, um, can take in excess of a day to reach, um, to roll from the Genesis block all the way to the current block, uh, which is fine when you've only got a few transactions a second. Scale that up by 100,000 times, and then it becomes impractical. Now you're talking about 100,000 days to reach um, a checkpoint. Um, not practical. So um, to reach the current time, because of course it keeps adding as you're trying to come up to speed. So um, but having a weekly checkpoint means that no matter how much activity occurred in the last week, you only need to roll, you only need to take the checkpoint and roll forward um, the transactions that have occurred since that point. Um, another thing to consider is that some legislation, such as GDPR, uh, enshrines the right to be forgotten. Um, that's not possible if you're if you've got an immutable uh, chain where every uh, block has to be recorded forever, otherwise um, the transactions that occurred in that block become invalid. So um, if you've got a mechanism that cannot run unless you keep every block, you may not ever be able to be compliant. Um, because of the, the way the design works. Whereas if you're checkpointing, you can still retain it for a legal amount of time, however many years it's required for taxation or any other legal requirement. But once that's been exceeded, um, GDPR kicks into effect and saying, well, if there's no legal requirement to keep an information, it should be destroyed. And so having a system that naturally, that, that's not actually a problem, um, makes it a bit more future proof. <coughs> Um, one of the things we're looking to do to scale it is to um, be able to have regionalized chains. Now, um, the Ethereum approach, which is not unusual uh, in these kind of solutions, is to use hashing. Um, so, use the hash of the address to determine um, which subchain any given address should be in. So, that way you get uh, even partitioning of all the addresses. The downside is that you get no uh, locality benefits at all. Um, the chance of any two people being on the same chain and doing a transaction is extremely low and it's completely statistical. It's quite random. So there's 100 subchains, you've got a 100 chance that a transaction will occur between two individuals on the same chain. So the most transactions are going to be between chains. And as you, if you break it up, it becomes almost highly unlikely you will ever have two transactions that won't involve two chains and having to coordinate them, um, which has got a higher overhead than working on the same chain. So the approach we're taking is that instead we'll use the ISO 3166 um, uh, regional codes. Um, it's about 4,000 regional codes for the world, uh, divided by the country, and then uh, <coughs> municipality, state, province, county, whatever the local term is, district in each country. And there's, there's about 4,000 regions there, uh, Victoria being one of them, for example. Um, and that, that gives you a, a much higher degree of um, uh, localized um, uh, subject. So for example, say you went, say it's split to the extreme, which you, you have 4,000 chains, and Victoria has its own chain. That still means that everyone in Victoria transacting with someone else in Victoria would still be on the same subchain. That'll be most of your transactions. And if you've got transactions in another region, like New South Wales or uh, San Francisco, have a second account in San Francisco, use that for all the transactions there. Um, so you can still uh, control the localization. Uh, the benefit to the entire system is that you reduce the code dependence between all these chains. Every chain has a much higher chance of being able to run completely independently and concurrently, and therefore get much greater scalability. So if you multiply this out, the, you can get about 400,000 transactions per second on each chain, 4,000 chains, and then you get over a billion transactions per second um, that it's capable of. Um, beyond this, it, it reverts to just simple hashing. So um, we don't imagine we'll ever get to that point, um, mainly because I can't imagine a use case for that many transactions that kind of transaction rate. Um, the largest in thing that I've 
seen anyone suggest is IoT, and it's been suggested that IoT might need up to a, a million messages per second, although they did also put the caveat, I'm not sure why you would need to put any of them on a, a blockchain, but even if you put every IoT message on a blockchain, it's still only got about a million a second. Um, so, in terms of scalability, I think we've got that pretty well covered. So we're looking at other aspects. So probably for us, I think the main thing to do next is to make it as easy as possible and to improve integration, which I'll talk a little bit more. So we've already talked about the smart charging. Uh, so um, like a lot of databases or uh, data grids or whatever, at some point to scale it out, you use some sort of sharding. In our case, we're going to focus on um, having regionalized accounts. So, so two examples is, um, you're all actually 64-bit. So um, uh, the first one is that starts in USNY because the region is New York. And the second one starts AUVIC because it's uh, local, uh, localized to uh, uh, Victoria. So it's still somewhat anonymous, like you can see the region that person is nominated. It doesn't have to be the region they're actually in, it's just that they will get uh, better transaction rates at lower cost in the same chain because the overhead of the system is lower. Um, so but the rest of it is anonymous um, and um, they probably live in that area but that's not necessarily given. So how does it start off? So initially, there's just one chain for the whole world. But then as you get more nodes, um, the uh, control mechanism can divide the system in two, which means it just takes the top bit, splits the chain in two. Uh, and then uh, when that needs to divide further, it takes the second bit and the third bit and the fourth bit. Uh, and in fact, to get the first letter, it has to divide five times. So um, if, um, if the the US chain, for example, divided five times, then at that point, the letter U, so every country that starts with the letter U would be in the same chain. It's not strictly entirely logical, but by the time you get uh, it divides 10 times, it will be down to a specific country. As I mentioned, uh, because it's multi-chain, um, yeah, and each subchain can do it. Um, so we, we estimate that a realist, more realistic number is probably 100 million transactions per second, simply because not all chains will be equal. Uh, they won't all have the same amount of activity. Um, one of them will almost certainly max out long before the rest are even very busy. So, um, so, uh, Nevertheless, it's still 100 million beyond anything I can imagine use case for. So in terms of integration, our initial focus is on fixed protocol. This has got a fixed engine, a high performance fixed engine, so we're making sure that all the exchange capabilities work via fix. And that will ease integration to the banks or anyone else using a fixed system. Um, Another thing that we've decided to add is, um, in, because we're running our own exchanges, we can add an AI to control volatility. So apart from having sta virtualized stable coins, which are based on fiat, so they'll be stable against the fiat, um, our own coin can be stable against, um, somewhat stable against other fiat currencies by manipulating the market. So we allow free movement to it, uh, within a certain bound, but um, beyond those bounds, it starts to either buy back or sell off um, as appropriate to try and keep it within those bounds uh, to reduce weekly movement. Um, it, it can only buy or sell off so much each week, but um, we believe this will help reduce momentum. Um, that's its only objective. So the AI itself runs in the blockchain nodes themselves, so that will be open and um, that, uh, to start with, it's controlled, it's very simple, it uh, 
sets an opening price for the week and then just puts a bid and an offer at 3% to high desire for that. Um, and it just sits there all week. Right, so with a particular volume. So within the 3%, it's just going to move around freely. As soon as it hits the 3%, it will uh, buy or sell off um, to, um, to try and stabilize the currency. Um, so in terms of our roadmap, we have a working prototype now. Um, we believe we can get, um, so I'm getting over half a million uh, transactions per second, but rather inconsistently. Uh, so um, I'm looking to improve consistency and then I'll be able to claim half a million. Um, we have a test system running, which is not publicly advertised yet, but we're looking to advertise that soon so that you'll be able to access it, um, access a web interface to the, to the back end. Um, but the, the source code is available now. Um, if you're interested in looking at that, um, we're also looking for accredited investor um, investments. So on the last page, we've got here um, my blog, which has got some articles uh, already on, on using it. Um, we've got a white paper and a website, and um, here we've got. Um, uh, where our source code, the open source source code for the core of blockchain is. And last but not least, um, uh, Jerry is uh, our guy based in Melbourne who um, uh, is the person to contact if you're interested in doing anything commercially with us. How many machines did you start with to set up these uh, new ideas in this year? Uh, in this case, I initially started with three. Yeah. Um, just because three-way availability is a little bit harder than two, yeah. uh, but it's a, just as a starting point. Uh, Have you considered using AWS? Uh, I was doing some research on Kubernetes and is uh, met most up to one another, sending SSH to mm -hmm. one another, and they have a small enough is to pass messages to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, is managing the uh, nodes, so you have better control, you can scale up, you can scale down. And uh, looking at AWS, have you ever considered that like a, like a regional basis we, on AWS? We haven't. Have we C haven't in the past because we've been very much focused on low latency. But now we're more focused on throughput, then AWS is a much more practical option. And they're, they're pretty fast. Again, they have different regions around the world, so you can start with five, you can scale up to ten, and they even have a dashboard to allow you to scale up and down. Security not a problem. The Kubernetes can handle the security, trusting on another SSH. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, performance wise, I think they're pretty fast. And they have uh, what are you looking for? I7, uh, 8 cores, and 32 gig. The, problem the, is the, the, the trust element is the fact that we may, may not be running the nodes. Uh, a lot of the individuals running the nodes in a blockchain solution, a public blockchain solution, are just random people running the software. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, and uh, obviously the software can be modified uh, or manipulated by people running the nodes to do anything. Uh, so that's where the trust element comes into it. So uh, the SSH uh, is useful when you've got multiple nodes working together. And that's right, it's a cluster that you mentioned, a cluster of five. Okay. Yeah, but between nodes, um, uh, there's not actually much point having encryption because um, all of the messages are public anyway. And um, it, because you're using signatures, you can detect if any one of them gets modified. So uh, they're both mutable and public, so you're not really protecting yourself much by having encryption. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what sort of throughput do you get when you start some transactions across the uh, regional chain? So if you want to uh, send money to someone within the region, yeah, so at the moment, um, yeah, so the thing is at the moment in our test we've only um, used high spec boxes, so the inter regional chain transactions are about the same throughput. However, realistically, um, once the system's more uh, heterogeneous and actually global instead of a data center, um, we expect it will get a lot less than that. So it's a bit hard to predict. What's what sort of transaction window? Obviously, five milliseconds globally is not at least 300 or something like that, right? It needs to be several multiples of the round trip. 
So it's more likely to be the tunnel between one and five days for the the interregional transaction. Uh, um, the throughput we expect to be somewhere between fifty and a couple hundred thousand transactions. But that's only between regions, and we're obviously trying to work very hard to minimise that. Um, what what's to stop someone from spinning up? Hundred or more uh, servers within our region and, and taking over the consensus. That so, is possible. Um, so, uh, so there's a couple of ways we can protect that. One is each region itself has a has its own credit and budget for the whole cluster. So you can't um, move money out more than. Uh, what the state allows. So all the nodes involved have to put up a stake, uh, which is at risk from fraud. So um, to, to run a cluster at all, there has to be enough nodes within that um, to run uh, run up a, a certain amount of credit in a week, for example. So uh, if there's not enough nodes to run a chain, then it will actually stop operating for the rest of the week until we get more credit. I'm not sure that it's too cautious, but at the moment we're taking a cautious approach that there could be individual chains that get compromised. And um, and so the stake offered by all the individual nodes is actually less than all the money in that chain. So therefore they could just say, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of my stake and just draw all the account. Um, so what we're looking to do is make it that actually the whole thing will stop. It's uh, uh, transparent. Cluster won't be able to transfer any more money out. Um, and then at the end of the week, they lose their stake, but they can't gain more than that much. Do you have a limit on the price of the Not at the moment. Uh, we may need to add one. Um, for tuning purposes, it's set by default to 32 megabytes. Because we're working on very short intervals um, of five milliseconds, that's actually a heck of a lot. Uh, because every every node in the cluster can produce a 32 megabyte block. So you've got 100 nodes, and you're doing 200 times a second. Um, that's actually more than the network can support. You wouldn't be able to replicate that much. So in, in reality. Um, that's only to handle when one particular node has a lot of activity and the other ones don't, or there's been some delay, or we're looking at much longer round times, like a second or five seconds. So realistically, um, we think the blocks could be around um, at most 100 kilobytes, um, just because our rounds are so short, and also because of the concurrency. So in Bitcoin, for example, um, there's only one block can be added in each round. Um, whereas, in fact, in our case, um, every node, even when the system's running normally, every node can add one block in each round. However, um, when a block is in catch up, so say a block is, uh, a node is behind, and um, there's like it's 10 blocks behind, it's produced 10 blocks, but it hasn't been replicated to the other nodes yet. Um, when they suddenly catch up, it can suddenly add 10 nodes, uh, 10 blocks as well. So we can only add one in each round, so we can catch up a lot more. So the number of uh, blocks being added in a round is much higher. So the size of each block becomes less important. Um, but, uh, yeah, for, for testing purposes, I, I have it set to about 32 megabytes. And I do actually see that grow occasionally in some tests. But I think in reality, um, it's going to be about 100 kilobytes will be more than enough to saturate the system. And is it possible to extend the system so that you can send out data along with the cloud system that you did in the center? Uh, mm, yes and no. So the only thing that we try to keep the transaction, the standard transaction very simple, but at the moment the only thing you can add is a reference code, like you would in a normal transfer. However, um, we're looking to make it very easy to add custom transaction types. And so um, one of the approaches we're looking to take is to support um, uh, basically a standard uh, YAML or JSON message. And that JSON message can be arbitrary data. 
and that that can be processed by the blockchain itself. Um, uh, and processed in the term, in, the term, in the terms of determining whether it's successful or not. Another key thing about checkpointing is that you need to determine whether a transaction is successful, not just to determine the order in which they occur. Because um, otherwise you can't produce a summary of those transactions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a question in terms of security wise. Yeah. Um, issue of terms of why uh, this hard thing about um, private key and public key. Yeah. Let's say, for example, a hacker gets a private key of some person in individual. Yes. And he uses that in order to get the money. But he can't create his account by just send it somewhere else. So, in terms of that, like, do we have like double layer of security just to um, protect the, whatever the transaction that's going to? Yeah, so um, one of the ways to protect a private key is to put it onto a piece of hardware. So you can get um, hardware keys, so nobody knows what a private key is, you don't even know what it is, it's, it's stored uh, and, and implemented entirely on a piece of hardware. And there is actually hardware for this particular um, I have seen suggestions that those uh, keys can actually be hacked in themselves. But um, there's a lot simpler ways to hack people at the moment, which we're looking to protect from. So, for example, instead of going through all the encryption, um, there's one piece of malware what it does is that when, you, when it sees you're trying to copy paste a Bitcoin address, it just replaces a Bitcoin address with its own. So then when you do a transfer to a Bitcoin address, you're actually just transferring to them. Um, part of the problem there is that the Bitcoin address or the DM address is very long and um, difficult to um, recognize. And so if you see one nonsense number and it gets replaced with another nonsense number, it's very easy to miss that to happen. Whereas what we're doing is we're putting a, a very short number in and it's got the region in. So if it suddenly changes region, for example, that's suspicious. Um, uh, you've got a better chance of picking up that this is happening. But I think there's some. Um, there's a lot simpler attacks that are out there that um, uh, are, are more important to try and protect against. Um, but you're right, that one of the things you might do, for example, is not to put all your money into one account with one private key. Um, so for example, if you go to the Ethereum Block Explorer, there is one account with over $2 billion worth. Okay? So, there's, there's probably quite a lot that a criminal or a criminal organization would invest in doing to get $2 billion. Yeah? So how about not just putting so much money into one account uh, when it's public uh, and um, maybe break it into multiple accounts. So one of the things we're looking at doing is uh, making support for multiple accounts. Um, and many of those accounts you might make it as a private key is not accessible, it's not even on from the air, you know, air separation point of view, and you have your operating capital in, a, in one of the accounts that's smaller. So all those accounts will have their own private key? They have, each one has its own private key. So to get the whole lot, you have to get all the private keys. Um, if you get one of the private keys, then you get more money in that account, but not any of the other. So there's probably, there's other ways of controlling, particularly for large amounts of money. It's, it's probably worth putting those kind of protections in place. Um, uh, for really small amounts of money, um, it's probably not worth the hacker's time um, to try and we try and we try and make it that it's prohibited. Where it's you know to get into a hundred dollar account, it's going to cost them a thousand dollars in labor. It's not worth it. Um, so you can't make these things impossible. You can just make it to the point where it's not economic. Addresses you showed are quite small to start. You know, is, um, so as far as the actual, how do you generate an address and, and is the, I guess, public key for that address is stored in a ledger of some sort? Or? Yeah, so the, um, the chain itself records each new uh, address that gets created against a particular public key. Right. Um, so, uh, part of the reason for keeping the short addresses is also when we do a checkpoint, um, that the number of addresses is 
relatively limited. Whereas in Bitcoin and Ethereum, every address anyone ever used for any transaction exists forever, even if it's never used again. Um, so that means that, for example, I think at the moment to record every every account for Bitcoin, you need a transaction, you need a table of about a terabyte, which is not such a problem um, unless you want to scale up by say 100,000 times. So many terabytes now, 100 petabyte lookup. You want to come up with a mechanism and say, well, actually, just creating addresses indefinitely. Um, isn't necessarily a desirable or practical thing. You want to probably find some way of keeping the number of addresses down uh, for something that's um, more worthwhile. Is there a cost to creating address? Like, what's the cost to creating? That comes into how are we actually going to implement the fee structure. Uh, so um, we can come up with different mechanisms, such as we can make it with a fee for creating an address. You can make it that it's free for an IP address once a week. You can create one address a week, you can create more, and you have to pay for it. Um, so we can, well, one of the good things about blockchain is that it's built on financial transactions. So every message can have a financial cost associated with it. You can stop spam, for example, by just putting a small fee on every message. So they can spam as much as they like, but they can't get drained and then off the stop. Um, or, um, you know, in the smart contracts area, you, you can write uh, an infinite loop, but it would chew, chew up so much CPU that it would drain your account. Um, you don't want to do that. So there's, there's, a, there's an inherent cost mechanism to every action. Um, if you have a look at um, Visa's fee structure, for example, it has something like 13 different types of fees for different things. We even charge not only per transaction, per amount, per bond of each message, uh, there's a per connection, per everything you can think of. Um, and, and once you've got those kind of control mechanisms in place, uh, uh, people are attempting to spam or um, uh, overutilize the system very easily discouraged. Um, we are looking to make uh, a certain kind of normal average use case free. So, Certain number of free transactions each week, uh, one free account for each verified user, things like that. But um, anyone who tries to use the system more um, will pay for it. Uh, hopefully, it'll be cheap enough that a lot of people will do that. But um, if you're going to create thousands of accounts, that can cost you. Uh, and you can do that, but not free. Yeah. I guess that leads into the question how do you actually? Get value into the system. Obviously, Bitcoin, you have a mining process. Um, lots of so this will have a mining process as well. There will be an initial number of coins that exist right from the start. Um, so uh, the real question is how do you get value into the system in terms of fiat? And that's where the exchanges come into play. So the exchanges can um, take currency in any other currency and um, you can buy, sell um, to get our own individual currency. So you start with a certain number of coins as a, as a base. Uh, those can be sold off or bought back for various currencies to exchange with. And then there's also an allowance for miners in each year as well uh, to run the system. So, uh, one of the things I would say is um, two things that I would say in terms of if you're evaluating any kind of blockchain solution is uh, is this a solution that actually requires a blockchain or is it just a solution that um, uh, could have just used a database? Um, and if you could have just used a database, then basically they've got some good idea or some good marketing idea and just put blockchain on it. And maybe that's kind of work, but you should go in with that knowledge that actually the, the blockchain element isn't having any technical benefit. Um, the other thing to watch out for is, you know, it reminds me of which um, Yeah, there, there's, there's a few things to watch out for if you're looking for trying to evaluate a solution. Um, there's the relative merit. Um, one of the ones I saw interestingly recently was, uh, 
turning an ICO for turning less valuable elements into more valuable ones. Which is not a new idea, but um, we've just put that with ICO and raising money on, on the place. 